Hey everyone, this is Kurt Frank, and welcome back to another episode of Teaching General Conference. This is a podcast or YouTube channel where we go talk by talk through the uh, general conference. I guess we're currently we're on October of 2022. We go through each talk and discuss how we can approach a lesson through that specific talk. So we're not here to dissect doctrine or concepts uh, in the actual talk. Mainly, just how are how would you how could we go about actually teaching? this content. And today we are focusing on, or in this episode, we are focusing on Sister Tracy Y. Browning's talk, Seeing More Jesus Christ in Our Lives. And so um, let's jump into this. So the first thing that uh, I'm always focusing on, you know, is to do one run through of the talk and try and uh, pick out doctrinal themes, right, or doctrinal sentences that are connected to as much of core doctrine as possible. And you can go check out the mini episode, I believe it's titled Teaching Core or Teaching Redemptive Doctrines to, to understand more about uh, the strategy. But we're going to go through and what you want is to, you don't, you're not looking for principles or applications or stories or anecdotes, you're looking for doctrine. And it may be hidden in an anecdote or a story, but uh, nonetheless, that's where you want to go. And again, I don't claim to have picked out every last doctrinal concept in this, but let me just show you what I came up with, with. I always put those doctrinal statements in yellow. So here's one. Our Savior's love for us individually and as his covenant children and also his teachings and laws are available daily resources that we can depend on to be a light which shineth, enlightening our eyes and quickening our understanding. As we seek for the blessings of the Spirit in our lives, we will be able to, as Jacob taught, see things as they really are and as they really will be. As covenant children of God, we have been uniquely blessed with a rich supply of divinely appointed tools to improve our spiritual vision. So I actually broke these up. These are two, I feel like they're kind of two uh, standalone doctrines. So this is being that the um, the Savior's love for us um, as his covenant children teaches and also his teachings and laws are available daily resources. So the doctrine is, is that God is giving, has given us resources. That is a doctrine. That is a truth. It's a core doctrine. I would even argue, right? That uh, from the beginning of time, he's always given his, kill, his children, especially his covenant children, tools and power. And uh, president Nielsen talked a lot about this concept. Well, that's an ongoing theme, definitely in this October, 2022 general conference. And then the second one, right? A covenant child of God, we have been uniquely blessed with a rich supply of divinely appointed tools. So I guess a little bit, uh, I guess it's very similar, but one is talking about resources, one, one is talking about tools. So you see how your mind is beginning to think, okay, what if we had a lesson where we moved in this direction of talking about what are these tools that, that God has given us? How would we identify them, right? All right, so we'll come back to that. Jesus Christ is both the purpose of our focus and intent of our destination. Right, Jesus Christ is obviously doctrinal. Right, um, that's at the core. His sacrifice and his laws and commandments in their lives. It was intended to bring them to greater understanding of their Redeemer. Okay, so we're given laws and commandments so that we have a deeper understanding of our Redeemer. Just as we are today, God's ancient people were invited to see their lives through Him in order to see more of Him in their lives. But by the time the Savior's ministry of the Israelites had lost sight of Christ and their observance, setting him aside and adding to the law unauthorized practices that no instructive symbolism pointing to the true and only source of their salvation and redemptive Jesus Christ. This, I mean, what a powerful statement. This could be your entire lesson, could be this paragraph. Now, the doctrinal concept is a little bit hidden in there because she's sort of uh, explaining it in the context of the children of Israel and right now, but the, the doctrine there, and you may even want to note these, right? Um, you may want to note these uh, either with a tag or you, or leaving a note here if you're do, using the gospel library. And the doctrine here is that the Savior should always be at the focus. It should not be, uh, commandments should not be the core or the focus of our, our worship. Um, ordinances or the way we do things should not be the center. It should all feedback to Jesus Christ. And again, if you go to listen to the mini episode of 
uh, teaching redemptive doctrine. Uh, this is exactly the concept I'm I unpacked in that episode as well. Uh, his final sacrifice led the shift from sacrificial burnt offerings to our rendering of a broken heart and a contrite spirit from the ordinances and sacrifice to the ordinance of sacrament. So this, man, a whole nother lesson just in that those few lines, right? So the, the concept, the doctrine here is that we don't give burnt offerings anymore, but we now offer ourself. And this, uh, we may come back to this President Ballard quote, which is a mic dropper for sure. And so that's it. Obviously, those talks that aren't in from the first pregnancy, they're quorum of 12, they're a little bit shorter, right? And so it makes it a little more digestible and easier to approach to, to pack into a lesson. Okay, so I encourage you to do that. Go through and just do one read over as, you know, you don't want to go through it too fast, but asking yourself the whole way through, where's the doctrine? Where's the doctrine? Where's the doctrine? Because that'll be your foundation to launch off into uh, into an actual lesson. Now I got to get used to this since, um, this, the nature of this podcast isn't like others where you listen to every episode. Maybe you will listen to every episode, bless your heart. Uh, <laughs> you're an overachiever for sure, but I would imagine most people will come back and uh, jump into one episode depending on what they're teaching. So because of that, I strongly encourage you to, ch to listen to all of the mini episodes. And that's where I unpack principles of teaching that can be really applied to any conference talk. So one principle I'll note here is going through this, pointing out all the doctrine, doctrinal statements or concepts, that doesn't mean you're going to teach all of them. But what that uh, what that does is helps you find one specific doctrine that you can launch into and teach from there, just that doctrine. And you can actually fill 40, 50 minutes very easily by doing that. All right, so now let's talk about the warm-up uh, portion of your, if you're teaching this class. So this is a a crucial concept that as you go into teaching a general conference talk, you don't want to just start into it, right? Maybe you read one paragraph. It's natural to just, you know, read one paragraph and then just say, so what do you think about that? Or, uh, is anybody have any thoughts on this talk or who remembers this talk? Did you like it? What, what stood out to you? Or we like to assume that everybody's, uh, <laughs> been a good student and read the conference talk beforehand. And we'd like to give them the benefit of the doubt and assume they have read it. So then we'll ask things like, so what stood out to you in this talk? And everybody's blinking at you because they didn't do their homework, <laughs> right? And they didn't prepare for this lesson other than maybe listen to it when general conference originally aired. So you want to warm up the room. And again, I'll talk, uh, check out the mini episode about this at the time of this recording. I haven't recorded it yet, but uh, maybe when you come back to it, <laughs> by the time you're listening to it, it'll be there. But this concept of warming up the audience that if you want people to participate and engage in your lesson, when you ask a question, if you want them to answer back, you have to warm them up. And let me give you a few ways to do this. I'll start with this, the most universal, my go-to, if I can't think of any other creative way to warm up the room, is I'll just come up with an extremely basic question that I can ask the room. What do you love about where you live? Or uh, I'm currently recording this in October. What did you, uh, what was your go-to Halloween costume as a child, right? Where were you baptized, right? Who baptized you? Or, you know, what was unique about your baptism? Or like these very simple questions, and maybe I'm even getting too complicated there. And it doesn't have to be gospel related. It can be, what's your favorite sports team? Uh, you know, what's your favorite place to vacation? What did you do this summer? What are your fall plans, right? What's your favorite Christmas tradition? right? The point is, is you're asking an extremely basic question so that you will, it's not hard to answer and it's more likely to, for people to speak up once they speak up and you may even call on some because you shouldn't feel uh, bad for calling on people when it's a very basic question that they, you're pretty confident they should be able to answer by doing that later on in the lesson, since they've already spoken up, they'll be, they're more warmed up. They won't be more likely to uh, speak up. All right, so that's one basic uh, warm-up activity that I go to all the time. Um, the other thing to do is in this in this talk, Sister Browning shares a story or a concept about when she wakes up, the first thing she reaches for are her glasses. Now, it's one temptation to – it feels like you're warming up the, the room or you're, you're introducing the talk to the room – one temptation is to sort of regurgitate this concept like, oh, Sister Browning talked about 
how when she wakes up in the morning or you may even read it right or share the share the clip but uh, the by doing that it's not as impactful it was impactful for sister browning because it's her experience so you can ask yourself in preparation i understand the concept that sister browning is teaching how does that apply to my life as far as what's an example from my life or a concept in my life where i could teach the same thing share it with the class and do that right maybe nothing comes to mind that's fine you can still focus on the the glasses and that concept just don't regurgitate it so for example i found on amazon there's this game I, I think my mom actually has this game and you don't necessarily need to buy it just for your lesson maybe you do and then you'll fam your family will have a fun family game to play but um the upside down challenge game you put on these glasses and it has some mirrors in it somehow and it makes the room look upside down and then the challenge is that you're trying to draw or do things uh in the in the game that uh, that are suddenly very hard for your brain to process because everything's upside down right i think it's even flipped horizontally um so you obviously could buy this game or you'd be surprised if you sent out a message to your ward's facebook uh group or to a neighborhood group and say hey does anybody have this game that i could borrow and then you could go into relief society or elder scorn with these really cool glasses right and you could have them try it on and then i don't know do some of the challenges ask them to write their name on the board but what you're doing is you're bringing lightheartedness to it, a, a fun and laughter to start. And that is naturally going to warm people up. So there's one idea. Another concept you could use to warm up the room is uh, the idea of bringing maybe three to five tools that you use on a regular basis. Because the concept that Sister Browning is teaching is that she uses glasses as a tool it's to see her life more clearly, literally, right? And so you may think of some tools that you use, not necessarily to see life more clearly, but to function in life more effectively, right? And it's a way to sort of introduce yourself. Maybe you're a woodworker, so you'll bring in some woodworking tools, or you're a mechanic, you bring in some mechanic tools, whatnot. And, uh, or you can invite just to engage some, um, some class members is call in advance and just ask maybe three to five participants in your class to bring one tool that they often use and then it gives them an opportunity to stand describe the tool and then you can ask them some follow-up questions like so how does this make your life easier how would you do these jobs and responsibilities if you didn't have that tool right what would that look like and again you're you're laying out the foundation of this concept which will launch into these doctrines that you'll focus on that sister browning focus on as well uh, but you're making it fun and you're allowing people to get to know people i mean the best result right would be for a other member of the of the quorum to stand up and connect with that individual after the class and say hey i do woodworking too and uh, you know tell me about your shop right and then they're connecting and it builds community and unity that way i also found this uh, i just through a google search i found this buzzfeed uh, game sort of an online quiz can you guess the blurry object and so if you had a projector and you could project some of this you know you, you type in an answer here you say it looks like a, a dog and then, oh, guess not, I give up. And then it shows you, well, it is a dog, I guess. I don't know why that didn't work. But anyway, so you could go through these and just, again, you're warming up the room with a fun game uh, that way. All right, so those are just some warm-up ideas. Obviously, you can come up with 10 plus ideas as well. The point is just you've got to warm up the room before you launch into a lesson. It really could be anywhere from three minutes to five minutes or even 10 minutes, depending on, on what it is. And there's various ways to do this. And you may want to listen to maybe all the episodes that we go through because you're going to get different ideas of types of warm up uh, activities throughout it. And I guess I need to do a mini episode of all of the warm up activities that I could probably think of, you know, or at least give you a good list. So at this point, we've read through the talk, we've identified doctrinal statements or concepts that are all throughout the talk, and then we're maybe going to pick on one specific one. We're going to use a warm-up activity that's going to introduce them to that doctrinal point, um, and then we're going to go from there. As I read through Sister Browning's talk, like there's a lot of just jam-packed paragraphs in her talk that you've got to allow the class to sit with and I digest. I noticed as I was reading over certain ones, I couldn't just read through it and move on to the next paragraph. I had to maybe go back, read it through one more time, stop on a sentence and really digest that. And a lot of people, you would hope that they've already done that walking into the class, but 
that's not reality. <laughs> so uh, you've got to make sure you create that space in the class to really digest whatever paragraphs you talk about, sit with, or even invite them to get into groups of one or two people and um, one, two or three people, I guess you could say, and, and digest the paragraphs together. Like, what did you notice about that paragraph? What I saw was this, this line or this word really stood out to me, right? If you just lecture and go on and on and, oh, I like this, this quote and that quote and this quote, uh, you're going to lose the class and they won't know, they won't have any doctrine to hang on to. They've actually learned in the class. All right. So if I was teaching this class, the, the paragraph that really stood out to me was the paragraph starts with in our lives right here. So this paragraph alone, what I've highlighted, especially there's just so much here, right? I've highlighted in yellow. There's a lot of doctrine there. And the simplest way, again, you don't have to come with the knowledge to when you teach a general conference talk, you don't have to be the Hebrew scholar, the PhD, the expert on all things doctrine. What you need to do is help encourage the class along to engage with the content. And that typically means maybe they're partnering up with somebody and or whatever it be to talk through the doctrine when they're actually doing the talking, they're doing the mental processing, then you have them on the right, right path. So this paragraph would be great. You could put it on the screen, you could print it out hand, hand it to others, they could pull it up on their phone, whatever it be, and just sit with this. So our Savior's love for us individually, and as his covenant children, and also his teachings and laws are available daily resources that we can depend on to be a light which shineth enlightening our eyes and quickening our understandings. And that's a <laughs> talk about a sentence, right? So maybe give them five minutes. Say, I just want to, I just want you to read over this paragraph. I want you to process it. I want you to digest it. What is it about this paragraph that stands out? All right, let's go. You take five minutes. It's quiet, right? All right. Now I want you to pair up with the, the person you're sitting by, or even to me, it, whether it's not the ideal place to teach, but it's Actually, one of my favorite places to teach is in the cultural hall or the gym, right? Because you have, it's typically folding chairs. You can move them and you can, you can get the, the people moving around a lot easier rather than being crammed in maybe a small relief society room, right? So, um, but you can mix them up somehow. Don't all, you don't always have to say, turn to your partner. It can be everybody born in June, stand up and you guys are going to talk or whatever it be. Right. And again, you don't want the, the, uh, groups too big, maybe no more than four. And then have them, there's two scripture references in that, that she's quoting from with that sentence. So you could say, all right, now that you've digested that, now let's go to the scriptures. What did you learn there? Right. And again, you're always coming back to what is the doctrine, right? I often say that in a class, what is the doctrine? If we were to write it down on the board, what is the doctrine? There's often times I have put that on the board and throughout the lesson, we're writing doctrinal statements, right? The more core doctrine they are, the better, right? But we're writing doctrinal statements on the board and that's drawing people to the, to the doctrine of what we believe, right? So they don't get lost in the, uh, you know, funny stories or anecdotes, which are fun and they have a purpose during general conference. But when we're digging in, trying to learn, we got to push them to the doctrine. Okay. So a few questions, and I'll put these in the show notes. A few questions that you could ask is what principles being taught here? What are two available daily resources uh, we can depend on? Because, or what are, what are the two uh, available daily resources we can depend on? Because that's what she mentions. And there's two resources or two things. And whenever there's a list of things, they say first, this, second, that third, this, like, man, circle those big because you can use that list. That's like an outline that they've given you to say, this is, these are the, the pillar concepts that I'm trying to articulate in this, in this talk. And that's where, that's where you can focus. And that's where you can build a lesson and find deeper understanding and have a spiritual experience there. Um, another question asks is, what do these phrases look like in real life? Because she uses these three phrases. Be a light which shineth, enlightening our eyes, quickening our understanding. Because in general conference, a, a thing that happens is that obviously they're, they're trying to put this talk together. They have a time constraint. They're talking to a huge international audience. And so sometimes they'll use these broad phrases that on the surface, they sound good, but like, what do they really mean? And so pushing that uh, classroom past that and saying, okay, these sound cool, you know, be a light which shineth and enlightening our eyes. Like, what does that actually mean? What does that look like in real life? Another one is, when have you seen these? Th another question you ask related to this paragraph. 
When have you seen things as they are and as they really will be? Take two minutes. Everybody sit with that. When have you seen things as they really are? Again, what does that even mean? It's a very scriptural term, but what does that mean in 2022 or 2023, right? What does that mean? And then you're engaging them to talk on a deeper level. And don't be satisfied with the, the superficial answers of like, oh, it just, it means to be an example. Like, okay, like give me, give me an example of you being an example. Like, was it in the office? Like, how do you show up to work? It's easy to say those phrases, right? So you're pushing them intellectually to come up with that application in their life. And then, or they may think, oh, wow, you know, I can think of things I should do to set an example, but I'm not doing it, right? Again, that's for the spirit to, to discover for them. All right, that which I've already gone over, I've got a few more ideas to share, but that alone, what I've shared, if, if I was to teach this lesson, like easily, that's 40 minutes, right? And maybe I'd do my media, you know, uh, media mix up, which I'll talk about and you do a, 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 I'll do a mini episode about that, which is just interjecting different forms of media to mix up the pacing mix up the tone, mix up the environment to a place that it draws people in. And I'll go over that in just a minute. But uh, there's also a paragraph of a covenant that starts with the covenant children. So it's actually the next paragraph. Right? <laughs> All right. So uh, it says the covenant children of God, we have been uniquely blessed with a rich supply of divinely appointed tools to improve our spiritual vision. So divinely appointed tools, like what a phrase, right? I love that. So and, and then she lists these out through it, that the word, these tools are uh, the words of and teachings of Jesus Christ that come in these forms, scriptures, words of living prophets, daily prayer, temple attendance, sacrament meeting. So a simple question you could ask is, how have these tools helped you restore peace and provide the necessary gift of discernment, which she also mentions in that paragraph. So give them two minutes, help them sit with it and think about it. What are the, um, cause you're helping them, you're, you're, you're inviting them to connect the dots themselves. So you could stand up there and say, this is how I connect the dots, but you want to turn to them and say, you connect the dots because you'll have a, it's a brain trust, right? You will get better examples. You will have more witnesses that come to the, the surface that testify of these truths by allowing them to do it. All right. And so at the bottom of the show notes, I, which I'll always do in these episodes, is I'll put a list of questions. And it's always good to walk into a class with a list of questions. You may have like, like good thought out questions. These aren't superficial questions. These are like ringers, like, oh man, this one is easily 10 minutes of discussion, right? Because you may have these warm up activities, these uh, engagement activities that you'll do. And you may think, I think that should take all the time. Well, sometimes it doesn't. And you're looking at the clock and you think, oh no, I still have 15 minutes. So I always go in with a list of backup questions that are thought out questions that come to my mind as I read through the conference talks. And so I encourage you to go look at the bottom of the show notes I have, or currently I'll probably think of more, but there's about 10 or so questions there that you could easily go to. You can, in those moments, we have 15 minutes later, you can say, thank you, Kurt, for putting those questions there because I can rely on them. Or of course, it's always best if you come up with your own questions. Another concept I'll uh, just mention that you may go go with is is filling in the blank. So in this quote, I guess I should say, he's she's quoting President Ballard. And she says, when we bring our offer to the Savior, we are, and so that may be a fill in the blank line. You could write that on the board, right? When we bring our offering to the Savior, we are, right? What does that look like in real life, right? We're taking scriptural language and we're putting it into modern day application and perspective and allowing people to fill that in. So people may say, when we bring our offering to the Savior, we are putting our desires aside and turning our will over to God. And that happened to me when I had to take a job last summer. Let me tell you about it. Oh, Brother Jones, please. Take, take three minutes. What tells the story, right? And there's going to be moments of like when God witnessed to them of, of his reality in their life, right? <clears throat> so that's another activity you can do. All right. So hopefully that gets the ball rolling. Obviously, I'm not suggesting you need to use all my ideas or that I have this perfect lesson plan that'll be a home run every time. I'm sure <laughs> it was not going to work for everybody every time. But uh, so we've gone through, and this is the, the structure you'll see over and over again, as far as uh, we're identifying doctrine, we're warming up the room. We're doing engagement activities or uh, is that what I call them? Engagement activities where we're drawing out, we're inviting the student to step into the, the context of the doctrines that, that we're not giving applications or what they should be doing or what I do as a teacher. You're giving them application or you're inviting them to share applications 
allowing for, for witnesses to, to stand. And what I mean by that is you may see someone raise their hand and have a passionate response to somebody or just to a concept or a, a passionate response to a doctrine. And you'll lean in and you'll say, wow, Sister Smith, like, tell me more about that. You seem really passionate about that. Or I couldn't help but notice you were kind of on the verge of tears. Like, what does that mean for you? Like, tell me more about that. And then suddenly they're witnessing of Jesus Christ in their life. Like, that's the type of dynamics you want. And then lastly, what I do, and this sort of comes up naturally, the more and more I prepare uh, lessons and concepts is I'll think, how can I mix up the media? Okay. Because what happens is if we just, uh, you'll maybe notice this in sacramenty, right? There's a clear cadence of sacramenty. It's a very lecture uh, focused cadence, which is fine. It works for sacrament meeting. I think there's a place for it, but not in the classroom, right? We've been asked to get away from lecturing and whatnot. And so, but what happens if someone just lectures for 40 minutes, then ne there's no media that gets mixed up in there. There's not a shift of, of the lighting. There's not a shift of going to a video clip or a, a, a song or whatever. So I, even though you might be engaging, having discussion going, it's always good to maybe slip in a a video clip and the church does such a great job with inserting, you know, maybe more on the come follow me side, but, or instead of reading a quote, one thing I do a lot is I'll um, have some basic video editing software. And so I'll clip out some, some media or, um, <clears throat> you know, that reminds me of, of a trick I will show you. Well, actually I'm going to make a note. I'll turn that into a mini episode, basically how you can easily take a YouTube, uh, the YouTube version of, a conference talk and easily find the uh you know mark the clips if you want to go into a specific paragraph there's this really simple way to do that so i'll make a, a mini episode about that as well but the point being is at the end of the lesson you want to or at the end of your lesson preparation you want to ask have i mixed up the median enough should i maybe just have them walk in with a song going on or Maybe I can just, as they're talking, I can in, I can play a song, or I know a perfect clip that it's kind of a funny, humorous clip that would fit perfectly in this in this area, or one of the Bible videos. I could show that clip, right? And the point isn't that you absolutely need that clip, or it's better at explaining a concept than you would explain it, but you're mixing up the media, you're shifting the atmosphere enough that it wakes people up and invites them to lean into the lesson. All right, so there we've done it. Sister Tracy Y. Browning's uh, talk, Seeing More of Jesus Christ in Our Lives. Uh, I'm excited to have Sister Browning uh, in this role, at least for the next five years is the typical trend uh, for these positions. Uh, there's so much we can learn from her, and it's going to be awesome. So good luck in all your efforts, and I'm praying for you as you teach a general conference. Mm -hmm.